victory. Thank you, Lord, that you give us the victory. up to the elections and even past, but listen, let's get in this altar right now and lift up our hands to the Lord and pray for revival in Washington, D.C., among our lawmakers, our president, those that represent and make laws, pray for our state, pray for our governor, pray for our mayor, pray for the mayors in the cities across Louisiana, let's pray for a move of God. God wants us to believe him. God wants us to believe him. And he is the speaking God. He is speaking. Nothing, nothing can hinder the move of God in the earth but unbelief in the people of God. But we believe you tonight, Lord. We believe you tonight, God, that you can humble kings and rulers and those that are in authority. We pray for their salvation, God. We pray for breakthrough tonight in the name of Jesus, God. Oh, Father, we pray in the name of Jesus for your glory, God, that men and women who represent and lead states and cities and countries, God, would fall on their faces before you tonight, confess you as Lord, and that they would rule, God, and they would make laws in the fear of God and according to your word, Father. Come on, just pray for a moment. Just pray for a moment. Pray in the Spirit. Pray in the Holy Ghost. If you're not sure what to pray, just pray in the power of God's Spirit tonight. A revival. Pray for the young people. Pray for the harvest that's in Antifa. Pray for the harvest that's in BLM tonight. Pray for them. God, bring them out. Bring them into Christ. Let them be your soldiers, Lord, in the name of Jesus.
crying out to If you know somebody tonight that's not well, they're fighting a battle of sickness or whatever it may be, take somebody right now that's next to you and say, pray for, pray with me. You just want to lift somebody up. Would some of you just begin to pray for Tammy for complete healing right now? Just complete healing in her right now. Just begin to pray for one another. Pray for the sick. If you're here tonight and you need prayer, please let someone know. Let me know. We'd love to pray with you, pray for you. Let's just believe God tonight. Just the ministry of His Spirit tonight. Pray in faith, church. Whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Let's take authority over the enemy and over sickness and over this virus in the name of Jesus. We plead the blood of Jesus over your people, God. We just pray for healing right now, God, in your people. Thank you, Lord. We thank you, God, for your power, God, your healing power. In the name of Jesus, God, thank you, Lord. tonight if you would just lift up the carpenters right now they're going to minister to us would you just begin to pray for them that God would anoint them and anoint us to be able to hear and to have faith to be able to do what God wants us to do 
I don't want to leave tonight just acknowledging there's a problem and something needs to be done. I want us to pray that God would anoint us, and He does. He already has. But we would, we would be doers, that faith would be active, and whatever way God would put it in our hearts to do it. So just pray for the carpenters right now. Come on, everybody, and just believe the Lord to minister in this service tonight. Father, we thank you for our guests tonight. We thank you for our friends. We thank you, God, for the fight that they have led, they have been a part of in leadership in our community for so long, God. And, Lord, we pray for strength and encouragement in them. We pray, God, that you would increase their faith and their stamina. We thank you for their health, God. In the name of Jesus, we thank you, Lord for the lives that have been saved, for the mobilization of your army, of prayer warriors and intercessors and evangelists, God. Thank you for the lives that have been saved. Thank you for the babies that have been saved. Thank you, God. Stir us up tonight, God. I thank you for Bailey. I thank you for Charles. I thank you for others, God, that have been stirred and have inspired our church to action. Thank you, God. Thank you, God. God. Amen. Thank you so much for praying with us tonight. And we're just so grateful. We usually have prayer meeting on Sunday nights, and so we just pray a little bit tonight. But we so welcome y'all. Please come up. And if y'all would, would you make the carpenters welcome? Amen. Thank you, my friend. We appreciate you being here. God bless you. Good evening. Clayley and I are so happy to be here tonight. We really do appreciate you opening up the doors for us to come in and, and, and talk about something that is passionate on all of our hearts. And we thank you for that opportunity. And Pastor, we thank you for your encouragement to, to send some of the jewels and the crown of this church out to pray at the clinic. It has been very special. Clayley and I have not always been in the pro-life movement. We've been seriously in the pro-life movement for about eight years. But that's not where our pro-life message started. Our pro-life message started many years ago when we had an abortion. And through the knowledge of the saving grace of Jesus Christ, by the blood of Jesus, we have been forgiven and now empowered to do what we're doing today. Before we get into the, to the, the main course tonight, uh, I would like to go through some scripture that has meant very much to Clayley and I. It's also, when you start looking for pre-born verses or passages, the Bible is full of them. And I would just like to, uh, could I, okay. Let, let, let me read the ones, these, these scriptures have truly been part of solidifying our faith in life and what God says about life. Genesis 1, 27 through 28. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. Then God blessed them, and God said to them, be fruitful and multiply. Fill the earth. For you formed my inner parts, Psalm 139, 13 through 16. For you formed my inward parts. You covered me in my mother's womb. I will praise you, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Marvelous are your works, and that my soul knows very well. My frame was not hidden from you 
when I was made in secret and skillfully wrought in the lowest parts of the earth. Your eyes saw my substance being yet unformed, and in your book they are all written, the days fashioned for me, when as yet there were none of them. Jeremiah 1.5, before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Before you were born, I sanctified you. I ordained you a prophet to the nations. So when you hear people argue about when does life begin, it's all right here. Now, what is God's design? He's, we have been made in his image. We have, a, we, we have the holiness of the Lord in us at birth. And he also knows what's, what he's going to use us for. So when you look at that in the framework of what is go, has gone on for 47 years, this is the truth. The rest of it's lies. I would like to go ahead and, and, and bring my wife up here, Clay Lee. Yes. Uh, of 43 years. So far, so good, huh? But we renew it every year. We used to joke around when the, we have to order new checks. Of course, you don't do checks anymore. So I'd look at him and say, yeah, before I order 500 more checks, let me think about this. <laughs> so we're still good. Okay. Oh, I keep looking for a microphone. All right. Well, it is a pleasure to be here. And um, our goal this evening is twofold. It is to help you to have successful, non-confrontational conversations with anybody. It could be your children, it could be your family, your neighbors, your co-workers, regardless of their position on abortion. We believe that the greatest and most lasting impact a church or an individual can have is when they confront slash change a culture with truth. Laws are powerful, they can dictate behavior, but truth can transform a heart forever. The church has largely shrunk back from this dialogue because we're intimidated. It's because we don't have knowledge. But tonight we're going to go through some common pro-abortion arguments and present the truth that will expose the lies and fallacies, and you will see how easy this is to do. We're also going to show some um, videos of animated abortions. That is also very important in talking to people about abortion. The second um, part was Charles is going to talk about what goes on at the clinic, the abortion clinic in town. I'm sure you know about that and how you might want to get involved. Okay, um, next. Okay, um, the truth about the preborn. Okay, the abortion issue has been made complicated by arguments with the sole purpose of justifying a woman's um, a woman getting an abortion right it's my body it's my choice um, rape but those are really only rabbit trails that divert from the one main issue what is the unborn knowing what the unborn should dictate whether or not we kill it right um, our position, the pro-life position, believes that the unborn is a human being at conception, and our moral argument is based on that truth. Next, please. Go back one more. There we go. Moral argument. I don't know if you can read that, but um, here's the moral argument. It is wrong to willfully kill an innocent human being. Abortion kills an innocent human being. Therefore, abortion is wrong. So in this argument, there's one question. Well, is the unborn a human being? So to validate our moral argument, we have to, you have to be able to prove that the unborn is in fact a human being. Next, please. Um, so we're going we're gonna to show three different aspects of the, of, of the unborn, that they're living, they're distinct, and they are a human being. 
The first one is, and, and we'll be, be in, this, in this argument, show three different pro-abortion arguments. For example, a pro-abortion person will say, well, we don't know when life begins. Well, a good answer for that is if we don't know when life begins, all the more reason not to have an abortion. But the fact is we do know when life begins. Life begins at the moment of conception. It is universal, settled science that a living egg and a living sperm combine to form a living zygote. And um, from that moment on, uh, that, that little zygote con continues to um, grow. And at that moment, all the cri scientific criteria for life are met. Uh, reproduction, cellular um, growth, et cetera, et cetera. So we can prove that life begins at conception. The next thing we have to do in proving that the unborn is a human being is that um, it's distinct and separate from the mother because a pro-abortion woman will say, it's my body, it's a woman's body, I can do what I want with it. Um, the truth is that the unborn has its own body and it's very distinct from its mother's. He has his own gender, his own blood type, his own brain, his central nervous system, and his own very unique DNA. Next slide. Thirdly, not only is the unborn living and separate from the mother, but the unborn is perfectly human. Um, the pro-choice argument says that the unborn is just a blob of tissue and only becomes human later. Well, her DNA is proof of her humanity. From the moment of conception, that little funny little miraculous blob has all the DNA she needs to grow and mature into full adulthood. She doesn't become human, she is already human. Now, she may not look human, but guess what? She looks exactly like she's supposed to look at that stage of development. We were all little zygotes, we were all little embryos. She looks perfectly normal. Okay, so let's go to the next slide. In, and this, this is just a, a conclusion. Using scientific evidence, we've proven that the preborn is living, distinct, and, and human, a human being from the moment of conception. Therefore, our moral argument stands strong. It is wrong to kill an innocent human being. Abortion kills an innocent human being. Therefore, abortion is wrong. That moral argument and understanding how to present the case for hu the unborn, the humanity of the unborn, will get you, if you know nothing else, through every argument, because everyone will agree it is wrong to willfully kill an innocent human being. Your job then, at that point, is to explain that at the moment of conception, this little thing is fully human. Everything she has to grow, okay? Is that, that's one thing I do want you to walk away with tonight. All right, next one, please. Challenging pro-choice arguments with the truth. Well, in, in um, defining the humanity of the baby, we just looked at three of those arguments. We don't know when life begins. Oh, yes, we do. It's a woman's body. No, it's not. It's just a blob of tissue. Well, it's a mighty special blob, okay? Those are three, but let's have fun with some more. Next slide, please. Okay. Um, all right, this is an interesting one. Abortion advocates who realize they can't successfully argue against the humanity of the unborn will argue that the preborn is human, but not a person. Interesting. Unfortunately, the, the, this goes back to Roe v. Wade when the Supreme Court ruled that the unborn is not a quote-unquote legal person, so follow me, and therefore not entitled to the rights of the 14th Amendment of our Constitution. The unborn is not a legal person, therefore not entitled to the rights of the 14th Amendment, which reads, no, no state shall deprive any person of life, liberty, or property without due process of law, 
nor deny any person within its jurisdiction the equal protection of the law. So essentially, in order to legalize abortion, the preborn could not be considered a person because if the preborn were a person, then the preborn would be entitled to the rights and protection of the 14th Amendment. It says essentially in 1973, the Supreme Court ruled, denied, officially denied the unborn legal personhood. But this, this language is all very familiar. We can go back to 1857, prior to the abolition of slavery, in the, 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 the Dred Scott decision, the Supreme Court ruled that blacks were three-fifths persons and therefore not protected under the 14th Amendment. Did y'all know that? That ruling was a mistake, and as you know, in time it was corrected. Roe v. Wade is a mistake, and I think we're all encouraged at this point with this president and the Supreme Court justices that we can taste, we can taste the reversal of Roe v. Wade. Um, but it takes time. I do want to, this comes out of the ruling Roe v. Wade. Listen to what the Supreme Court says about its own ruling about the unborn not having legal personhood. Quote, if the suggestion of the personhood of the unborn is established, the appellants, that means the pro-aborts, case of the course, of course, collapses. For then the fetus's right to life is guaranteed by the 14th Amendment. Even they knew at the time their definition of a person was on shaky ground. Okay, so that was kind of a background, but let's keep going. So, so when a person says, uh, yeah, it's a human being, but it's not a person, okay? So you, here's where you go. You say, okay, well, tell me what, a, what you think a person is, or when does a human being become a person? And their arguments quickly fall apart because we understand personhood as being more of a philosophical thing because there is no scientific or medical evidence to say that at what point a human being becomes a person. There's no gene that suddenly pops up and says, you're a human. Y'all following that? So abortion advocates, so here's what they will do. Um, they will argue that a person, when you ask them that question, a person, well, a person has mental and physical abilities. They can think and process information. They can do things. Um, and they'll say they're not so dependent on another creature for life. Depend, you know, all of that argument. But the question to ask, but the question to really ask them, and this is where they, they usually you can stop them, is, well, what about those who are living now? Those with mental illnesses and diseases and those with physical impairments and, um, or congenital deformities or strokes or dis disabled from accidents, are you saying that they're not persons? Would we kill them also? And what about the elderly, the special needs children? And what about a newborn who actually is considered a legal person? How, how is that baby even different from one hour before it was born? But, but they're dependent. They don't have, they can't do very much. So um, are the, you just ask them, so are, are, are they not persons? They, they become very quiet. But here's the sad part. If mental and physical abilities or dependency or lack of th thereof were a criteria for establishing personhood, then millions of people would lose their 14th Amendment rights. And therefore... They would become targets of elimination, ethnic cleansing, and that's exactly what we saw in Nazi Germany. The conclusion to this big argument is that a human being is a person, and a person is a human being. That's how it's always been. And the, the only reason to argue otherwise is to justify abortion. Okay, next slide, please. Here's another, um, a very common argument. Uh, it's a woman's right to choose. Have you heard that one before? Okay, to that I would say yes and no. For example, we're all in favor of choosing what we eat or what we wear or who we marry. 
<clears throat> but should we have the right to kill someone if we choose to? Or do we have the right to take property, personal property from someone else? Every civilized society restricts the freedom of an individual to choose when that choice harms another person or infringes on that person's rights. And clearly, abortion infringes on someone's rights. So really, the, the question to ask is, a right to choose what? And I want you to remember, as we go through these arguments, there's always that moral, moral argument that you can use. It is wrong to kill an innocent human being. Abortion kills an innocent human being. Therefore, abortion is wrong and proving their humanity. You can always use that. Um, and also, in all of these cases, you can say, what about adoption? Those are the two always, always you can, you can present when you're talking to somebody. Okay, next slide, please. Rape and incest. This is the most common argument you will run across. Even Christians who say they oppose Abortion will say, what, will say, well, in the case of rape and incest. I've, and that's part of what we do when we, do, when we talk to Christians. Hey, what do you think about abortion? I'm against abortion. I'm against. So we will act, actually purposefully ask them, well, what about rape and incest? Just to stir up an argument. Oh, well, yeah, except in that case. So then, then we have to sit this Christian down and say, okay, let's see why rape, why rape and incest is not a pro-life position, okay? And, and really recognize that less than 1% of all abortions are due to, uh, to all pregnancies are due to rape. But in dealing with this, this is a very t t sensitive subject, obviously for women who've been raped, but most of them, most, most women who've been raped will seek an abortion because they believe that that child will remind them of the rape. We, uh, and we understand that, but the truth is we don't kill people just because they remind us of a painful event. Is that right? And, you know, in this case, in the case of abortion, why should an innocent human being pay for the crime of the father? Okay? Um, the other thing to consider, rape and incest are violent crimes, and as, as painful and traumatic as they are, you tell this woman that abortion is just actually is more traumatic in that it has longer lasting effects um, throughout your lifetime. The, um, it seems like the right uh, uh, um, decision at the time, and that's what we try and tell women at the clinic, it seems like the right addition, uh, a decision now, but sweetheart, please think about the rest of your life. 65% of post-abortive women suffer, are clinically depressed, and suffer from this thing called PAS, post-abortive syndrome, wherein you see um, increased suicides, infertility, miscarriages, and breast cancer. It, it's like, you know, if rape is not traumatic enough, darling, why add another trauma to your life? Um, and we, you know, and you also part of this argument is all the, the beautiful testimonies of mothers who have chosen to keep their babies um, that have resulted from rape, as well as testimonies of individuals who were conceived in rape and mothers who chose to keep them. Bottom line is a child is a child regardless of how he was conceived. And again, we have the moral argument. And again, what about adoption? Those are. Okay, next slide. Okay, this is a really, this is a great argument. Um, and it hits a lot of things. Let me read it. I personally don't agree with abortion, but I don't want to force my views on someone else. Sounds like a good excuse to be quiet, doesn't it? That's like saying, I'm personally against child abuse, but I defend my neighbor's right to abuse his child if that's his choice. The reason for personally being against abortion, i.e., it kills an innocent human being, is reason enough to speak out against anybody having an abortion. 
to be personally against abortion and to do nothing about it is essentially to promote its legitimacy. And here we are 47 years later. Question, is the blood of the innocent on our hands because we did not speak out and warn as Ezekiel warned us? I don't know. What about the Jewish Holocaust? The church knew and the church was too afraid to say anything. Is the blood of millions of Jews on their hands? I don't know. But I know this. It's not enough to just hate evil. That's exactly what the devil wants us to do. That's what the radical left wants us to do. Be quiet, be politically correct, and say nothing. Yet God has called us to be light and salt. Light is the source of truth and revelation. If a society does not receive light and truth, their darkness just grows darker. We are the source of truth. We are the immune system for a society and a nation. If we don't speak the truth, our, our immune system is weak and our country, our cities, our families will decay and grow sicker and sicker. I want to read Proverbs 24, um, 11 through 12. Rescue those who are unjustly sentenced to die. Save them as they stumble to the slaughter of their death. If you say, surely we did not know this, does not he who weighs the heart consider it? He who keeps your soul, does he not know it? And will he not render to each man according to his deeds? Unquote. Next slide. This is another common argument. Again, these are so many of these are just based on lies. The life of the mother, we don't want abortion um, to become illegal because the, of the life of the mother. There should always be allowance for abortion. abortion. Well, it's, first of all, it's very rare that a mother um, is threatened during pregnancy or childbirth. But if that were the case, every effort would be made to save both her and the baby. That has been how it's always been, and whether abortion is legal or illegal, it will be as it always is. Next, please. Have you ever, have you ever heard about the back alley abortion? Have y'all? Common, huh? It's kind of easy to buy into it. Oh my gosh, the coat hanger, the back alley. Well, women do have choices to not go into the back alley, but for the most part, that... Um, there are, there, there are no cases of back alley abortions reported. It's another lie. And um, again, the premise here is that if abortion is made legal, thousands and thousands of women will die from back alley abortions. That premise is so false. The truth is that when abortions were illegal, the majority were, were done in back offices, maybe under the cover of darkness, but in back offices by physicians with medical equipment. And guess what? If abortion were made illegal, that's exactly what would go on. And even now, abortion is, is slipping secretly into private homes and being done privately in homes. Um, it'll all, they have their ways. The other false pre um, premise here is that legal abortion equals safe abortion. And that's just not true. Since Roe v. Wade, over 400 have died from abortion, and many, many more suffered from botched abortions. Just last year at Delta Local here, a woman had a botched abortion. She was raced to the hospital. You know what happened to her? She killed her baby, but they took her uterus, and she'll never have another baby. Very sad. <sighs> okay. How are we for time? Because I can go on. But I think we're going to stop right here. Could you go to the next slide? And we're, gonna, we're not going to do that. Um, and just go to the next slide. I want to also let you know that there's so many arguments. And in a full presentation, we cover lots of them, but it takes a long time. There's a book by Randy Alcorn I recommend to you on, on the, all the ar arguments. It is so good. <clears throat> I recommend you get it. You just... Read it, read it, and it just brings so much life to you. 
Um, <clears throat> okay. This, um, truth about abortion procedures. Okay. Um, one thing to know is that uh, a lot of people assume that a, an, an abortion procedure is just simple and safe, um, that it eliminates, just eliminates something. You're not pregnant anymore after it. The abortion clinics call it eliminate products of conception. The word baby is never mentioned in an abortion clinic. That's like, ah, products of conception. But the re and we're, we're going to show four, three-minute videos. They're animated videos that show first, second, and third trimester abortions. And, of course, they're not graphic, but we, um, we do encourage you to look at them. But if you don't want to look at them, bow your head or you can, or you can leave. Uh, but I, I find them very educational. Or you, if you think your ch there's some children in here that might be too young, I would, um, you may want to walk them out as well. But, um, but knowing about abortion pre procedures, when I'm talking to someone about abortion, that I will, if they're still hard-hearted, I will go, do you want to know what an abortion procedure is like? And at that point, every, the game it's the game changer, okay? Um, okay, next slide. Okay, Rachel, would you go ahead and get a 12-week baby out for me? A, there's the slide. You can't maybe not be able to. Yes, you can. Well, all the, the yellow stuff, the, the mustard stuff, is 88 per, it is 88%. And 88%, thank you, 88% of abortions occur um, with up, up until 12 weeks. And let me tell you about this little baby. Uh, this is what a 12-week baby would look like. There's some in the foyer you can take with you. He's about three inches. All of his body parts are present, his eyes, ears, arms, legs, fingers, and toenails. All of his major, major organ systems are in place. They just need to grow. His heart has been beating since he was three weeks old. His brain waves have been detected since he was six weeks old. And he can dis discern outside stimuli. Okay. Thank you, Rachel. Let me put it down. Okay, um, we may want to dim the lights, and are you? We're ready for the first uh, video. Oh, oh, wait. Can you back up? I think there was a slide to introduce it. The first. Okay, I'm sorry. Okay, that's it. First trimester surgical abortions up to 12 weeks. I'm sorry, and it's called suction aspiration. Thank you. My name is Dr. Anthony Levitino. I'm a practicing obstetrician gynecologist and I've performed over 1,200 abortions. Today I'm going to describe a first trimester surgical abortion called suction DNC, dilatation and curatage. This is the most frequently performed abortion and is used typically from 5 to 13 weeks of pregnancy. After administering anesthesia, the abortionist uses a speculum like this. This is placed inside the vagina and opened using this screw on the side, allowing the abortionist to see the cervix, the entrance to the uterus. The cervix acts as a gate that stays closed for the duration of pregnancy, protecting the baby until it is ready for birth. The abortionist uses a series of metal rods called dilators, like these, which increase in thickness and inserts them into the cervix to dilate it, gaining access to the inside of the uterus where the baby resides. The baby has a heartbeat, fingers, toes, arms, and legs, but its bones are still weak and fragile. The abortionist takes a suction catheter like this one. This is a 14 French suction catheter. It's clear plastic, about nine inches long, and it has a hole through the center. It is inserted through the cervix into the uterus. The suction machine is then turned on with a force 10 to 20 times more powerful than your household vacuum cleaner. The baby is rapidly torn apart by the force of the suction and squeeze through this tubing down into the suction machine, followed by the placenta. Though the uterus is mostly emptied at this point, one of the risks of a suction DNC is incomplete abortion. Essentially, pieces of the baby or placenta left behind. This can lead to infection or bleeding. In an attempt to prevent this, the abortionist uses a curette to scrape a lining of the uterus. The curette is basically a long-handled curved blade. Once the uterus is empty, the speculum is removed and the abortion is complete. 
The risks of suction DNC include perforation or laceration of the uterus or cervix, potentially damaging intestine, bladder, and nearby blood vessels, hemorrhage, infection, and in rare instances, even death. Future pregnancies are also at a greater risk for loss or premature delivery due to abortion-related trauma and injury to the cervix. As I mentioned... Okay, next slide. Okay, we just watched a video of a first trimester surgical abortion, um, and that's, those take place up until 12 weeks. There are a lot of women now getting chemical with a pill abortions, and they can get a pill abortion up until 10 weeks. My name is Dr. Anthony Levitino. I'm a practicing obstetrician gynecologist and I performed over 1,200 abortions. Today I'm going to describe a first trimester medical abortion. This is a procedure in which the mother swallows pills in order to terminate her baby and it is performed up to the 10th week of pregnancy. The procedure involves two steps. Step one, at the abortion clinic or doctor's office, the woman takes pills which contain mifepristone, also called RU46. RU46 blocks the action of a hormone called progesterone. Progesterone is naturally produced in the mother's body to stabilize the lining of the uterus. When RU46 blocks progesterone, the lining of the mother's uterus breaks down, cutting off blood and nourishment to the baby, who then dies inside the mother's womb. It is important to note that even after it has been taken, it is possible to reverse the effects of RU46 and save the baby if progesterone is administered. The sooner, the better. Step two, 24 to 48 hours after taking RU46, the woman takes misoprostol, also called Cytotec, that is administered either orally or vaginally. RU46 and misoprostol together cause severe cramping, contractions, and often heavy bleeding to force the dead baby out of the woman's uterus. The process can be very intense and painful and the bleeding and contractions can last from a few hours to several days. While she could lose her baby any time and anywhere during this process, the woman will often sit on a toilet as she prepares to expel the child, which she will then flush. She may even see her dead baby within the pregnancy sac. At nine weeks, for example, the baby will be almost an inch long, and if she looks carefully, she might be able to count the fingers and toes. After she has disposed of her baby, the woman may have bleeding and spotting for several weeks. Bleeding lasts, on average, 9 to 16 days. 8% of women bleed more than 30 days, and 1% require hospitalization because of heavy bleeding. The failure rate increases as the pregnancy progresses. If failure occurs, she will usually be offered a surgical abortion. For the mother, medical abortion often causes abdominal pain, nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, headache, and heavy bleeding. Maternal deaths have occurred, most frequently due to infection and undiagnosed ectopic pregnancy. As I'm Next slide. Okay, this would be a second trimester surgical abortion, and it takes place between 13 and 24 weeks. Rachel, would you get, we have a sample of a 20, um, a 22 week old baby. She's about 10 inches long. She has lots of movement, hair, eyebrows, eyelashes, and by now her body would be producing hundreds of thousands of eggs in her ovaries as a guarantee for future generations. Okay, thank you. My name is Dr. Anthony Levitino. I'm a practicing obstetrician gynecologist and I've performed over 1,200 abortions. Today I'm going to describe a second trimester surgical abortion called dilatation and evacuation, or D&E. A D&E is performed between 13 and 24 weeks of pregnancy. After administering anesthesia, the abortionist uses a weighted speculum, like this one, that opens the vagina widely. Because second trimester babies are so large, this greater access facilitates a late-term abortion. Late-term abortion requires that the cervix be prepared 24 to 48 hours in advance with laminaria. 
Laminaria is a type of sterilized seaweed that absorbs water over 8 to 12 hours and swells to several times its original diameter. Once removed, metal dilators can be used to further open the cervix as needed. Once the cervix has been stretched open, the suction tube is placed inside. A baby at 20 weeks gestation is as big as the length of my hand, from head to rump, not counting the legs. The suction machine is turned on, and pale yellow amniotic fluid surrounding the baby is suctioned out through the catheters. With babies this big, they don't fit through catheters this size. The baby's bones and skull are too strong to be torn apart by suction alone. This is a sofa clamp. A sofa clamp is made of stainless steel. It's about 13 inches long. The business end is about two and a half inches long and a half inch wide, and there are rows of sharp teeth. This is a grasping instrument. When it gets a hold of something, it does not let go. The abortionist uses this clamp to grasp an arm or leg. Once he has a firm grip, the abortionist pulls hard in order to tear the limb from the baby's body. One by one, the rest of the limbs are removed, along with the intestines, the spine, and the heart and lungs. Usually the most difficult part of the procedure is extracting the baby's head, which is about the size of a large plum at 20 weeks. The head is grasped and crushed. The abortionist knows he has crushed the skull when a white substance comes out of the cervix. This was the baby's brains. The abortionist then removes skull pieces. He removes the placenta and any leftover parts of the baby with a curette, scraping the lining of the uterus for any remaining tissue. The abortionist then collects the baby parts and reassembles them to make sure that there are two arms, two legs, and all the pieces. Once all the parts have been accounted for, the abortion is complete. For the woman, this procedure carries a significant risk of major complications, including perforation or laceration of the uterus or cervix with possible damage to the bowel, bladder, and other maternal organs. Infection and hemorrhage can also occur, which can even lead to death. Future pregnancies are also at greater risk for loss or premature delivery due to abortion-related trauma and injury to the cervix. As I mentioned... Okay, next slide. Um, the last video we're going to see is, is a video of a third um, trimester surgical abortion. Um, it goes from still um, 24 weeks all the way to full term. Would you get the 22-week-old baby? Uh, 24 weeks to, to nine months. He's 14 inches long, 22. Mm -hmm. Or you can do 26. I'm sorry, 26. Um, he's busy sucking his thumb and somersaulting, 80% survival rate if born. In Louisiana, abortions can be performed only up to 20 weeks. There are other states, however, where, leg where abortions are legal all the way up to birth. The Democrat platform today supports abortions all the way up to the point of birth. Thank you. My name is Dr. Anthony Levitino. I'm a practicing obstetrician gynecologist and I've performed over 1,200 abortions. Today I'm going to describe a third trimester induced abortion which is performed at 25 weeks to term. At this point, the baby is almost fully developed and viable, meaning he or she could survive outside the womb if the mother were to go into labor prematurely. Because the baby is so large and developed, this procedure takes three or four days to complete. On day one, the abortionist uses a large needle to inject a drug called digoxin. Digoxin is generally used to treat heart problems, but a high enough dosage of digoxin will cause fatal cardiac arrest. The abortionist inserts the needle with the digoxin through the women's abdomen or through her vagina and into the baby, targeting either the head, torso, or heart. The baby will feel it. Babies at this stage feel pain. When the needle pierces the baby's body and the digoxin takes effect, the life of the baby will end. The abortionist then inserts multiple sticks of seaweed called laminaria into the woman's cervix. They will slowly open up the cervix for delivery of a stillborn baby. While the woman waits for the laminaria to dilate her cervix, she carries her dead baby inside of her for two to three days. On day two, the abortionist replaces the laminaria and may perform a second ultrasound to ensure the baby is dead. 
If the child is still alive, he administers another lethal dose of digoxin. The woman then goes back to where she is staying while her cervix continues to dilate. If she goes into labor and is unable to make it to the clinic in time, she will give birth at home or in a hotel. In this case, she may be advised to deliver her baby into a bathroom toilet. The abortionist then comes to remove the baby and clean up. If she can make it to the clinic, she will do so during her severest contractions and deliver her dead son or daughter. If the baby does not come out whole, then the procedure becomes a D&E, a dilation and evacuation, and the abortionist uses clamps and forceps to dismember the baby, piece by piece. Once the placenta and all the body parts have been removed, the abortion is complete. Late-term abortions have a high risk of hemorrhage, lacerations, and uterine perforations, as well as a risk of maternal death. Future pregnancies are also at a greater risk for loss or premature delivery due to abortion-related trauma and injury to the cervix. As I mentioned at the beginning, I'm Dr. Anthony Levitino, and in the early part of my career as an OBGYN, I performed over 1,200 abortions. One day, after completing one of those abortions, I looked at the remains of a preborn child whose life I had ended, and all I could see was someone's son or daughter. I came to realize that killing a baby at any stage of pregnancy for any reason is wrong. I want you to know today, no matter where you're at or what you've done, you can change. Make a decision today to protect the preborn. Yes. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Thank you. Um, before I turn it over to Charles, I just want to say I know you're a repenting church. Um, and what I pray for more than anything else, I do pray for the abortionists and the moms, but in Ezekiel 9, Ezekiel talks about putting a mark on those people who mourn and grieve over the abominations committed in their city. We as Christians have hearts that have grown callous to the abominations of our land. And my prayer for every church and throughout this nation is that God would restore our tears, that once again we would grieve and mourn over the atrocities that are committed in our land. Thank you. Uh, I would like to, to end by just talking about some opportunities. And these opportunities are, 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 are numerous. You know, there is a change in the land. The, in the last four years, there's been a major change in the land. And these are those times where, and given LSU's record, maybe this is not a good example, but uh, we are in the red zone on this one. We're close to that goal line. And now is the time to engage this. And what are those opportunities to engage this? Those videos took it out of the abstract and brought it closer to the reality. When you're out at the clinic, and you will be there, on, I think it's October 26 on Monday, and if the schedule stays the same, the, the clinic will be open for business. And when you see the young ladies walking in there, faces of fear and all the emotions you can imagine. They don't want to be there either. But whatever abstract concept will absolutely vaporize when you see a real going in there and later on in the afternoon coming back out. So that is one of those opportunities. Now this is a prayer vigil. 40 Days for Life is that prayer vigil. And the power of prayer is is demonstrated time and time again during 40 Days for Life. Last year, we had 136 saved babies. That was throughout the year. 40 of those was within that 40 days. This year, week before last, we had four. Last week on Tuesday, we had five saved babies. That just has not happened. So the battle is raging in the heavenlies, and guess who is winning? Amen.
in addition to 40 days for life, the real push right now is looking at November the 3rd on the, the uh, Love Life Amendment. There's a lot of reasons why we need to vote yes on this. But one, what, what it does is when Roe versus Wade is repealed and overturned, then the authority for managing regulation of abortions comes back to the states. So we come back to 1973 where it was illegal to do abortions in the state of Louisiana. States, 14 of them, have, to, have basically seen that possibility and have sued through the state side of the courts up to the state Supreme Courts, and 14 states have found the right to have and fund abortions in their state constitution. This shuts that door in Louisiana. And if you think about it, we're a pro-life state. We're, we brag about that. But, but there has never been a statewide referendum on life. This is a statewide referendum on life. So we not only need to win this battle, we need to win it convincingly. So the promotional materials and everything else that, that, are, that have been pushed, it's a statewide election, the churches are engaged. So we, we really do believe in a, in a great outcome. Uh, the, the other opportunities out at the clinic are the, the learning how to do sidewalk counseling. Generally, we do the mentorship kind of model that you go with somebody that has done it and, and, you, and you learn from there. It can be very satisfying and it can also be very trying as well. In January the 23rd, we have the Louisiana or the Baton Rouge March for Life. All of these opportunities are gathering steam and bringing awareness, and and we we are we are excited of what what is happening. Right now, there's only one abortionist doing abortions, surgical abortions in South Louisiana, between two abortion clinics here and there. And we believe that there might still be a, spark, a tiny flame that she may walk out of there someday. So we, we, in closing, we want to thank you very, very much for your attention. We, uh, when you're out there on the 26th, Clayley and I will be out there. Any questions you might have, we'd be more than happy to address those at that time. And we've left a, a pad out there that if you want to get a copy of, of Clayley's notes and or a copy of the uh, scriptures and prayers for the abortion clinic, just put your email down there. And we'd be happy to provide an electronic copy of that. There's also out there 12-week babies and the, the, the little bracelets for 40 days for life. And feel free to take a... There'll be more of those out at the clinic if you come, so. Once again, thank you very much. And Pastor, we thank you very much for allowing us this time. Thank you. Thank you so much. That was um, difficult but necessary, I think, to, to be able to understand what is really going on. And... Um, some of you probably have seen some types of um, animations like that, but if this is your first time seeing, it's very, very sobering. And um, I was reading a book, and it, it's called Ordinary Men. It was written about um, barbers and school teachers and shop owners and managers of markets and so forth in Germany who were brought under Heinrich Himmler's police force. And these are common men who were sent into Poland to do an uncommon job. And um, they were forced to police the Jews and murder the Jews just by the thousands and thousands. These are just dads and barbers and shop owners and school teachers, you know, 
They had families they were going to go back to. But they were so brought into this, by the end of it, they were all mass murderers. Their whole demeanor had changed. But the point of the book is that when we read history, it's very common for us to put ourselves in the good place of history. And we would read about Nazi Germany and we'd say, you know, I'd be a Diedrich Bonhoeffer. I wouldn't be like that. I wouldn't take people's lives. But the Diedrich Bonhoeffers are the exceptions. And the truth about history is when you look at the numbers of people that allowed what went on in Germany to go on, we probably would have been with them. We probably would have been the German society that looked the other way or even participated in the Holocaust of the Jews. And so I appreciate the carpenters coming here because you forced us to look at this and not look the other way. And I don't believe we're the kind of people that will look the other way. Um, I believe the Lord has moved in our hearts and given us a burden. I want to thank Bailey. Um, is she in here? Okay. Um, yeah, go get her. I want to thank Charles, too. Um, but Bailey had a real burden to go out to the Delta Clinic and just begin to pray. And she's inspired us, church. And, um, and I thank the Lord that it doesn't have to come from a, quote, professional minister to motivate a church to do outreach and to do wonderful things that need to be done in our communities. I want to thank the two of you for fighting so hard and standing so strong um, in a valiant effort that I know is close to the heart of God. So thank you so much. And I'm grateful that we have this opportunity to start joining together with you and to participate in the 40 days of life, to be able to cast the proper vote in the November election. You do not want to vote for an abortion, an abortionist or an abortion platform, and then have to go stand before God and tell him why you did it. Um, if you would stand before God to tell him why you did it. Uh, so I think it is very important for us to understand this is a significant moment in our history. As you have encouraged us by saying there's sparks of, of hope, there's sparks of change that are taking place. Well, the Holy Ghost is wonderful at making fire, isn't he? And so we just pray that these sparks become tremendous. We're going to receive an offering tonight. We want to bless them. We also have um, some signs. Um, Mr. Carmen, if you would... Yeah, I'll hold this up. I think we have 50 of these, Christy. We have 50 of these, and we would like all of you to take one. The church is buying them tonight, and so your offering is going to go to this, but we would like for you to uh, purchase one of these. Well, you're not purchasing it. You're giving it in an uh, on offering tonight, but we have these for you. So please take one or take two. Take one for a family member if you think they'd like to put it out in their yard. Um, we need to really promote this. Don't be afraid. Don't fear. Um, let your voice be heard. These are ways we can speak. These are ways we can bring attention to the fight, you know. And so I ask you and encourage you to do it. And so thank you for, for that opportunity. And then we also want to be able to just bless them with an offering personally for coming and taking their time tonight to share this with us. So would you do that, please? You make a check out. You, uh, people don't do checks anymore. Venmo, whatever, electronic giving, however you want to do it. Um, if you do write a check, you can put it out to FNT. Um, you can just put cash in there if you would like to, and then we will uh, give them a check, and we will hopefully be able to bless them very good tonight. So <clears throat> um, I really appreciate your spirits. I appreciate your heart, and it's very kind and very humble, and I thank the Lord that he's raised you all up to do this. The, the demeanor that you have is very powerful. Thank you both. Father, I pray in the name of Jesus that you would receive this offering tonight. I pray, Father, that you would use this, Father, to help the effort to spread this word, to bring attention to this, this fight that we must engage ourselves in. I thank you, Father, so much for the people that have stood strong in Louisiana to make the voice of God heard like 
the Louisiana Family Forum and Gene Mills, Father, that have taken such a stance, Tony Perkins and others, Father. But I thank you in our city for the carpenters and others. I thank you so much for Bailey and how she's inspired us, God. And Lord, I just give you the glory tonight that this offering would be more than sufficient for the needs that they have. In Jesus' name, we thank you, Lord. Amen. While the offering's coming around, Bailey, would you just come up? Would you talk to us about the 40 days of life? I was asking her in the 40s. She said, please let me talk. I love to talk now. And so she said, I want to do it. So we're going to let you do it. But we do thank you, Bailey. Thank you so much for inspiring us. Well, now that I'm made to do this, <laughs> I just wanted to clear up any confusion y'all might have. Um, so we'll be across the street from the clinic and we, I think y'all liked us to stay separate from the actual sidewalk counselors. Um, so y'all won't actually be speaking to any of the girls, right? It's really, you're really just there to pray. So I don't want anybody to feel scared, like, oh, I need to know what to say before I go. Um, so you got October 26, 7 to 7. You can just pop in, stay for 30 minutes. I know it's a work day. Um, so just whatever y'all can do, be, it would bless us. Thank you. Amen. And there is a sign up. In the foyer. Did you want to say something else? No, that was all. Jordan wanted me to say that. There's a sign up in the foyer. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> <clears throat> so please do that. Um, you know, some of you men may want to do it right after men's Bible study. I signed up for the 7 o'clock spots to go out there. Um, but whenever you can, we just appreciate you doing it. Would you show your appreciation to the carpenters, please? <laughs> Amen. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. <laughs> Hallelujah. And I want to thank you for sharing your story of redemption and forgiveness because there's probably a lot of people in the church that have gone through an abortion and they're too scared to speak about it. But thank you that God has given you the courage to do that and the healing that God has brought into your life. And so we appreciate that so much. I know that's not easy, and it's not easy going around talking about this. So uh, we, we really do just appreciate you, and we want to pray for you all. Father, thank you so much for the carpenters. Thank you, Father, for what they have brought to us tonight. And thank you, Lord, that they didn't just come and talk to us about this tragedy, but they've given us doors of opportunity to be engaged. And Lord, we pray that by the power of the Holy Spirit, you would use us, that you will lead us. We want to be the people of faith. We want to believe you, God. We know, Father, that you're moving in the earth, and we just want to believe with you. We want to be action, put action to our faith. We want to show you our faith. And, Father, we thank you so much that the heavens will open, that your Holy Spirit will fall. Father, that this doctor who does abortions, the only one in this area, and we pray, God, in the name of Jesus, that this doctor would be saved, that this doctor would be born again, Father, in the name of Jesus Christ. Father, we thank you that this doctor would know forgiveness and redemption, Father. And Lord, I just thank you so much that you would bring life, God, to the people in their pain, in their conviction. Let them turn to Jesus, Lord. All these words that have been spoken by the Christian community, by the sidewalk counselors, those are words of life, Father. You sent it out, Father, to accomplish what you desire. And it's not going to return to you void. It is having an effect in their life, God. And we, we pray, God, for those lives in the name of Jesus. Thank you for this night. We ask your richest blessings upon our friends, God. And we thank you so much for them. In Jesus' name, amen. I thought some of you even might like to come by and talk to the carpenter, so we're going to close this way. Thank you so much for coming. We so appreciate you and all of your help in this endeavor.